Hello. Today we will be going over atrial fibrillation rate control in the emergency department, primarily with a focus on metoprolol and diltiazem. My name is Aaron O'Connell, a pharmacy resident at Brainerd Hospital. Our objective of the lecture will be to evaluate class 2 and class 4 antiarrhythmic impacts on the cardiac action potential, examine the AHA atrial fibrillation rate control reference studies, and to determine proper medication selection and dosing. Primarily, there are four different classes of antiarrhythmic medications. Our class 1 would be our sodium channel blockers, class 2 are beta blockers, class 3 are potassium channel blockers, and class 4 are calcium channel blockers. When we think of rate control, we usually will go with a class 2 beta blocker or a class 4 calcium channel blocker. Occasionally, we will dip into the class 3 antiarrhythmic medications, such as amiodarone, to also help achieve rate control. Our class 2 antiarrhythmic medications are our beta blockers. A couple of examples would include metoprolol, carvitolol, propranolol, or esmolol. Beta blockers ultimately work by blocking the action of catecholamines at the beta-1 adrenergic receptors within the heart. Ultimately what this does is slows conduction through the SA and the AV node to prolong phase 4 or the refractory period. Moving on to our class 4 antiarrhythmic medications, our calcium channel blockers, we would primarily use verapamil and diltiazem for this. These Medications primarily work at calcium-dependent cardiac cells in the AV node. Ultimately, by blocking calcium channels, we reduce the inward calcium current during the action potential and during phase 4. As a result, conduction velocity is slowed through the AV node and the refractory period is prolonged. I would like to briefly go through the AHA rate control recommendations. Our class 1 recommendations are to use a beta blocker or a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker for rate control. Our class 2A recommendations would be to have a goal heart rate of less than 80 if the patient is symptomatic, and that IV amiodarone may be useful for critically ill patients. Our class 2B recommendations would be to have a heart rate goal of less than 110 if the patient is asymptomatic and that oral amiodarone may be used when other measures are unsuccessful. Of note, the guideline does go on to talk about patients with heart failure. For those patients who have a preserved ejection fraction, it is still appropriate to use a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. For patients that have reduced ejection fraction, this is when we would want to use a beta blocker, and if a beta blocker alone is not sufficient enough to handle their rate, then we would want to move to something like digoxin. After briefly having gone through the AHA rate control recommendations, I wanted to focus on the studies that they had decided to look at in terms of making those recommendations. The first one is a study of the evaluation of the landmark affirm trial looking at rhythm versus rate control done by Alshansky's group. This involved over 2,000 patients which were followed for an average of three and a half years. Ultimately, they wanted to determine which medication would be the best in terms of rate control as an outpatient with long-term benefits. Overall, they defined their rate control as a heart rate on average at rest of less than 80 and either one of the following, a heart rate max during a six minute walk of a less than 110 or an average heart rate during a 24 hour Holter monitor of less than 100 beats per minute. Overall, they found that rate control was best achieved with the patients receiving beta blockers compared to the patients receiving calcium channel blockers or digoxin. Of note, more patients were changed from calcium channel blockers or digoxin to a beta blocker as well. Ultimately, this tells us that for patients that are going home and have problems with rate control or AFib, we do want them to be on a beta blocker because the outcomes have shown to be better. In another study done by Ellen Bogan's group, they wanted to determine if diltiazem would be an appropriate treatment for patients with AFib in terms of heart rate control. In the Elibogid trial, a therapeutic response was defined as a heart rate of less than 100 or a greater than 20% decrease in heart rate from baseline or conversion to normal sinus rhythm.
Now, the Allenbogen trial had a little bit more of a complex trial design. Patients would go on to receive a 20 mg deltiazem bolus. 15 minutes later, if they had not reached the therapeutic response, they would again receive another deltiazem bolus of 25 mg. If during the first or the second bolus they achieved that therapeutic response, they would then go on to be randomized to receive either deltiazem infusion or placebo. Once randomized, patients were monitored for a 24-hour period in 30-minute intervals. If a patient had failed to maintain response on two consecutive 30-minute time checks, they would then go on to the next stage of the study and be considered to have not maintained this response. The next stage of the study was to again give another 20 to 25 mg deltiazem bolus and again look for that therapeutic response, which was again a heart rate of less than 100 or a greater than 20% decrease in heart rate from baseline or conversion to normal sinus rhythm. If they had achieved a therapeutic response following the second series of boluses, then all of these patients would go on to receive a diltiazem infusion of 10 to 15 milligrams per hour. After having gone through the Ellenbogen trial design, it is now time to talk about the results of the study. Of the 47 patients that received the initial diltiazem bolus, 94% of them had a therapeutic response and went on to be randomized. The patients receiving placebo, none of them had a maintained response at 24 hours whereas the patients that received the diltiazem infusion, almost three-quarters of them had a maintained response at 24 hours. Overall, 41 out of the 47 patients went on to receive the diltiazem infusion. Of the 41, 83% of them had a maintained response at 24 hours. The conclusion of this study is that patients that respond to diltiazem followed with an infusion would be expected to have a maintained response at 24 hours. In another study performed by Sue's group, they wanted to compare IV diltiazem to the Jackson and amiodarone, and ultimately found that rate control was better achieved with diltiazem compared to the Jackson and amiodarone. Rate control for this study was defined as a ventricular rate of less than 90 beats per minute. Moving on to a few more studies now referenced by the AHA rate control guidelines. The first study here is one performed by Platia's group, which wanted to determine how well esmolol would compare to verapamil for heart rate control. Esmolol was given as bolus and infusion, and verapamil was given as boluses. Ultimately, they found that both agents had significant heart rate lowering abilities. The difference came for patients converted to sinus rhythm. 50% of the patients treated with esmolol converted to sinus rhythm compared to 12% of patients for the verapamil treatment. This study tells us that both agents would be useful in lowering heart rate, but in terms of converting to sinus rhythm, you are more likely to achieve this with esmolol compared to verapamil. Moving on to the next study done by Dell. 60 critically ill patients went on to receive a 25 mg bolus and continuous infusion of 20 mg per hour or amiodarone 30, 300 mg bolus, or an amiodarone 300 mg bolus followed with a 45 mg per hour infusion for 24 hours. They defined the success of the study by a greater than 30% rate reduction within four hour period. Ultimately, when comparing the three different treatment groups, they did not find a difference between either of them. They did note that diltiazem was discontinued more frequently for hypotension compared to amiodarone. What this is telling us is that for patients that are critically ill, amiodarone appears to be as effective as diltiazem and perhaps will cause less hypotension. Of note, for patients that received the bolus versus the bolus and infusion of amiodarone, there was a 20% difference between the two groups. So the conclusion of this study for critically ill patients it is appropriate to use amiodarone bolus and infusion. In the next study performed by House Group, they included 50 patients and they wanted to determine how well amiodarone or digoxin would decrease heart rate. After one hour, the mean heart rate drop for amiodarone was 157 to 122, which was significant. 
They noted that digoxin had fewer dramatic alterations for patients after one hour, which makes sense. Digoxin has a complex loading schedule and would not be expected to work quickly. The conclusion of this study is that amiodarone will give you a faster effect than digoxin in lowering heart rate. Now the last study I will evaluate here was one performed by Clemos Group in 38 hemodynamically destabilizing critically ill patients. Now what I mean by this is these patients were all in the critical care units and they all had received conventional therapy. And conventional therapy would be diltiazem, metoprolol, um, attempted, ver attempted cardioversions as well. These patients would then go on to receive amiodarone. And they found that amiodarone was associated with a decrease in heart rate of less than or of grade of 37 and an increase in systolic blood pressure. This is significant for patients in the critical care setting with blood pressures dropping below 100. This in conclusion tells us that for these patients, it is appropriate to consider adding amiodarone, decrease heart rate, as well as maintain systolic blood pressure. Now, more recently in 2015, Brahms Group put out a trial comparing beta blockers to calcium channel blockers in 52 emergency department patients with AFib or A flutter. The intervention was a diltiazem initial bolus of 0.25 mg per kilogram with a max of 30, or an initial metoprolol dose of 0.15 mg per kilogram with a max of 10. If the primary endpoint had not been achieved within 15 minutes, a second escalation dose was administered. The escalation, escalation dose, or diltiazem, was 0.35 mg per kilogram, or again a max of 30, and metoprolol was 0.25 mg per kilogram, with a max of 10 mg. Now the primary outcome was measured at a heart rate of less than 100 beats per minute, and they looked at two different timestamps, one being the five minutes and the other being 30 minutes. For the first five minutes, 50% of the diltiazem group had achieved a goal heart rate of less than 100, compared to only 10% for the metoprolol group. By 30 minutes, 96% of the diltiazem group had achieved this, whereas 46% of the metoprolol group had achieved this heart rate goal. Of note, the onset of metoprolol is approximately 20 minutes. So we would not expect to see a big effect from a metoprolol group until about 50 to 60 minutes out. Now, if this study had compared it at 60 minutes versus or perhaps 90 minutes, the results may look a little bit different. But of note, these results are significant, in fact, because it appears as though deltizem will give you much faster relief than metoprolol will. So for patients that are extremely symptomatic, this may be a benefit for these patients. More recently, in 2016, the Heinz Group put out another study comparing beta blockers to calcium channel blockers. This was a retrospective cohort study involving 100 patients presenting to the ED. Patients were given IV diltiazem with an initial IV dose of 13.6 mg or IV metoprolol, an initial dose of 5 mg. Each group went on to receive about the same number of boluses, which was 2 plus or minus 1 the results of this study involved a heart rate decrease at one hour. For the metoprolol treated group, they had a baseline of 140, which dropped to 113 at one hour, and diltiazem had a baseline of 143, which dropped to 110. This decrease in heart rate comparing the two agents was not significantly different between them. They went on to further evaluate for a lenient heart rate goal of less than 110 or a strict heart rate goal of less than 80 at one and two hours and still found no significant difference between the two groups. They also noticed that there was no difference in adverse effects between them either. Of note, the patients that did receive diltiazem, the average diltiazem dose was about 0.14 milligrams per kilogram, which is lower than the recommended initial bolus dose. If they had dosed a little bit higher in terms of the diltiazem, the results could have been different, so it is something to note. But the studies do tell us that metoprolol compared to diltiazem does not appear to be different in terms of the one hour time span.
Now, having gone through the studies that AHA rec referenced in their recommendations and a couple of more recent studies, I just want to talk briefly about the medications, specifically metoprolol and diltiazem. Our beta blocker of choice is metoprolol. Metoprolol is a selective beta-1 adrenergic receptor blocker and should be dosed at 5 mg IV every 5 minutes for a max dose of 15 mg in a 15-minute period. The onset of action is expected to be approximately 20 minutes, and some relative contraindications would include myocardial infarction and bronchospastic disease. For patients with asthma, you will want to determine the severity of their disease. For severe patients, it may be best to avoid beta blockers. But for patients with more mild cases, metoprolol may still be considered as it is selective for beta-1 receptors. Our calcium channel blocker of choice is diltiazem. When initially dosing, we want to start at 0.25 mg per kilogram with a max of 20 mg. If we have not seen our desired effect after 15 minutes, we may follow this up with repeat bolus at 0.35 mg per kilogram with a max of 25 mg. The max doses recommended here are from Lexicon. However, studies have used max doses as high as 30 mg, which have shown to be safe and effective. So after we have given our two boluses, we can move to two options. First, if we have seen the desired effect we are looking for or heading in the right direction, we may consider starting an oral option at this point and sending the patient home. However, if we have not seen a response or the response to this point is not satisfactory, then it may be time to consider starting a diltiazem infusion. When starting the infusion, we will begin at 5 to 10 milligrams per hour and may increase by 5 milligrams per hour up to a max of 15 milligrams per hour. Of note, the IV diltiazem onset is approximately three minutes, so we would expect a quick response, and the duration of action is one to three hours. You should expect to have this duration be about one to two. I have included here just a couple of thought questions. Which medication do you prefer when choosing for rate control? And why would you decide to go away from one or the other? The data does not tell us which one is expected to be more efficacious for an acute therapy. While deltiazem has a faster onset, we know from the AFIRM trial that patients do better on beta blockers. When choosing in an acute situation, we should determine the disease states of our patients, specifically for patients with heart failure or asthma. For patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure, we should use a beta blocker. For patients with severe asthma, we should use a beta blocker. Thank you for listening to my presentation on antiarrhythmic medications in the emergency department setting with a focus on metoprolol and diltiazem. For further information, I have decided to include a couple of extra information slides on the other antiarrhythmic medication classes.